But I want to get right to it, into our first session, and we're going to talk about manhood, manliness, what it means to be a man this weekend. And if we're honest, and if we think about it, there's a lot of confusion about what it means to be a man in our day, isn't there? Our day and age is a twisted one. As Jesus Christ described it to his disciples, we could describe it today. He said this is a faithless and adulterous generation. This is especially evident when it comes to the idea of manhood. What makes a respectable man? One that obeys God. If you were to ask our society, you might get a different answer, wouldn't you? If you ask our society, what is an ad admirable man? You know one of the questions that we're asking in our nation today? Are men actually even men? I was on a college campus recently. I went up to college students. Some of you are about to be that, and some of you may be that already. And I told them, I said, what would you tell me, two young men who are about sophomores in college, maybe about 19 years old, I said, what would you tell me if I told you that I am a woman? You know what they said? I'm, I'm not lying. They said, good for you. <laughs> There's confusion in our day, isn't it? About even if men are even men. On the other end of the spectrum, we are told that a man, a true admirable man, is defined by his sexual conquests and putting others in their place and being emotionally strong and stable and dominant. It's kind of that old picture of the husband coming home, kicking his legs up on the couch and telling his wife, make me a sandwich as he watches Sports Center. We know the image, right? The kind of machismo, chest out, chin up idea of manhood. Our culture is confused about what a true man is. I want you to mull in your minds that question. What makes a real, genuine, admirable man? We live in a twisted age. Just look at the men we're following. Music artists like Lil Wayne, Kanye West, Jay-Z, Maroon 5, Drake. These are the men that are leading the culture. They are, as Kanye West said a couple of years ago at a music award show, he said, we are the thought leaders of this nation. And he's right. Movie stars are admired and esteemed, yet they're womanizers and unfaithful husbands. Think of the President of the United States, or you think of those in high places, an immoral man in his personal life, and look through the record book of presidents. This is not something strange. Look through the presidents in age past, and they are often immoral men. This is the day and age we live in. So, ask yourself, what are the marks of true manhood? That's the question we're going to spend our time answering this weekend, God willing. But tonight, in this opening session, I want to ask you another question. What will it take for us to understand God's definition of manhood? That's what we're going to talk about. What is God's definition of manhood? But tonight, before we kick into that tomorrow, I want to ask you this question. What will it take for us to understand God's definition of manhood? What will it take for us not only to understand, but to become ourselves men who are shaped by God instead of shaped by this culture? You want to know the answer? It will be by putting before our eyes the greatest man to ever walk the earth. Who is that? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely. Think of Christ. Jesus Christ stared Satan himself in the face and defied him. You realize Satan is not like God, right? Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all at once. When Satan was before Jesus Christ in those 40 days, after his 40 days fast, and he stood before Christ, that's the only place Satan was. You and I, perhaps, I don't know this, but perhaps we've never even had an encounter with Satan himself. You realize that? Maybe we have. More probably, we've encountered 
his minions, the demons, right? But Jesus Christ stared Satan himself in the face and defied him to the point where Satan backed off, defeated. Jesus was a real man. In the same, in the same breath, Jesus Christ wept for those he loved. Talk about the macho culture, right? Man doesn't show tears. Christ wept. When Lazarus died, he wept. When he looked at the unbelief of the Jews, he wept. Think then of Jesus in the temple. Zeal for my father's house consumed him. What did he do in the temple? He flipped tables. And he drove the men out. And said, get out of my father's house. You're profaning it. Demons were scared of Jesus and begged him to be merciful to them. Think of that. Demons begged Jesus. Matthew 8, when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. People were scared of these men because of the demons in them. Watch what happens. And behold, they cried out when they saw Christ. What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to cast us out before our time? Demons trembled when they saw Christ. It's a phenomenal picture, isn't it? Jesus stared down the wicked rulers of Rome and defied their evil with his words as well as his silence. I want you to think about this because we can read these accounts of Christ, right? And they become so common to us. But think about it. You, think of yourself, you, you're dragged to the highest ruler in this world, a physical ruler. You're brought through the palace. An army has come to take you. You, think of yourself. Are you imagining this? Who here is imagina- has an imagination? All right, good. Imagine yourself. You're dragged before the highest ruler in the world, and that ruler sitting in his power, surrounded by armies which in a moment could destroy you. You defy them to their face. Christ did. Herod brought him before him and essentially said, give me a show, Jesus, and Jesus didn't answer him a word. This is Christ. This is God in the flesh, the greatest man to ever walk the earth, the hero of all heroes. Think about the climax of Christ's work on on, on earth. He died. He died for sins that others had committed. I've heard some pretty fascinating stories of heroes, haven't you? Who's a Superman fan? So everyone else is a Batman fan. Hey, we think about these stories, don't we? These stories that live for decades. These are hero stories, right? The hero swoops in and saves the damsel in distress. We hear that, right? Think of Christ, the Savior of the world, who died for the sins of millions, though he himself had committed no sin. Guys, this is our example of true biblical manhood. Would you agree? Christ is the epitome of what it means to be a man. He did not mistreat women, but he valued them. He was not arrogant and selfish, but he was a humble servant. He did not abuse and take advantage of the poor, but he lived amongst them, healed them, provided for them. He did not despise those whose society put in the gutter, but he healed them, he kissed them, he loved them. He was the ultimate humanitarian. He was the ultimate gentleman, the ultimate hero. Jesus Christ is the ultimate picture of a man, the greatest man to ever live. And guess what? The Bible tells us that we are to imitate Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved 
us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus is the ultimate picture of manhood, and the Bible tells us that we are to follow in his footsteps. Am I being clear? It's a glorious picture of Christ, isn't it? However, guys, there is a big problem with this. We cannot come to act like Christ and be be conformed into his image until we have come to know Christ. We cannot act like Christ until we enter into a relationship with Christ. We cannot imitate the life of Christ until we know Christ. And you say, okay, so how do I have a relationship with Jesus? Well, before I can tell you how to have a relationship with Jesus, I need to tell you some very, very bad news. Every single one of us in our natural condition as humans, are infected with sin. Listen to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59 too. He says, your iniquities, that's a word for sin or transgression, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Your sins have created a separation between you and God. Do you realize how bad your sin is? Do you realize how dark and evil your sin is? You realize the Bible tells us that sin permeates every fiber of your being. Your mind, your heart, which is your will, your desire to do things, your body, your emotions, permeated by sin. I want to ask you a question, and you can answer it, but in order. What is the worst sin you can commit? Who's got the worst sin? What's the worst sin you can commit? Yeah. Murder. Murder. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. What is it? Turning away from God. What's your name? Jacob. Jacob. To rebuke God is to say that you are not affiliated with him and do not care to know him. Unbelief, to rebuke God. Never try to know him in the first place. Adultery. Adultery. Hatred. Hatred. Praising the devil. devil. Profanity. Profanity. What is that? To give up on him. him. They're all the same. They're all the same. Okay, let me go here. All those answers, those are sins. Those are sins. No, it's not a trick question. There's a right answer. Turn to Romans 1 if you have your Bible. It's up on the screen as well. But turn to Romans 1. Great answers. Everything you mentioned, blasphemy, murder, adultery, turning away from God, not believing in God in the first place, rejecting God, worshiping the devil. But I want to tell you the worst sin that a man commits is called idolatry. I want to show you this. In Romans chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 18. Listen to this, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. That means clearly seen. They've understood ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Let's pause there. What he's saying is men know there's a God. And the way they know there's a God is that it's plain to us in what has been made. Okay? God has revealed himself. His invisible attributes have been made known through the things that are made. But notice how mankind responds to God. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God 
or give thanks to him. But they became futile, that means kind of empty or vain, in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Now listen again. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and notice the next word, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Notice that. Mankind refused to worship God. They refused to worship the creator, the all-glorious one who made them, and instead they worshipped and served themselves rather than the creator. This is idolatry. It's misplaced worship, right? We are beings that naturally worship. Haven't you noticed that? Some of you, I found out tonight, really look up to James Harden and the Houston Rockets. I'm personally a 76ers fan, but don't hold that against me. We're doing okay. But have you noticed in our society how we elevate how we elevate one another, and even there's kind of this idolatry and worship of sports stars or movie stars, right? Misplaced worship. Man was made for a purpose, namely to worship and glorify God, this glorious creator, and instead they worship and serve themselves. Now notice what he says next. We're still in Romans 1. Look at verse 26. For this reason... What, for what reason? They began worshiping themselves instead of God, right? And so because man has worshiped themselves and the creation instead of the creator, for that reason, God, verse 26, gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now I want us to read, this is a lengthy section. Yeah, it's up there. But notice, every single sin you guys just mentioned is mentioned here. Watch, verse 28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Do you see what's happened? Because men turned from worshiping and serving God, they were given over to everything else. You can think of it like a tree. Think of all the sins you mentioned, adultery, sat satanic worship, idolatry, murder, all this stuff. Oh, it's little leaves in this tree. And they just keep popping out, don't they? And the trunk of that tree is idolatry. Misplaced worship. Guys, ultimately, in your natural state, the state into which you were born, the condition into which you were born, is a condition of idolatry. Self-worship. Have you ever wondered why you do what you want to do? You go where you want to go. You say what you want to say. You think what you want to think. You act how you want to act. You behave and do. And because you, you're bowing down to the idol of self. I'm king. I'm the boss. I'm the one who rules my life. I, 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 I sit on the throne of me. It's idolatry. Misplaced worship. Which means... Now, guys, this is going to be very important. I'm going to give you an illustration, illustrate this in a moment, which means 
You are not just sinning when you murder or curse or blaspheme. You are sinning whenever you do anything out of allegiance to self instead of allegiance to God. We've got to get this. This is profound. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God looks down on the children of man. Kind of like here, I'm elevated, I'm looking down. You know what God says when he looks down at humanity? It says this, God looked down upon mankind and he saw that the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Only evil. All the time. That's what God saw when he looks at mankind. And you say, wait, wait a second. Even guys who murder are nice to mom, right? I mean, they, even, even men who do bad stuff, they're not doing bad stuff to everybody. But God looks and says, every thought you think is pure evil. And you go, how is that possible? It's only possible if we have a biblical understanding of sin. Namely, sin is not just murder out there. Sin is misplaced worship in here, which results in those, those actions. Do you, are you following me? Think of it like this. Here we are. We've seen a war movie, right? Imagine with me again. I like your imagination. We zoom in on a battlefield, and here's a guy, and he's, he's in, the, the bullets are flying. There's bombs going off, and here's a guy, and he goes over to his buddy, and his buddy's legs have been taken out by a bomb. And he picks his friend up and he puts him on his shoulder and his friend is saying, no, go, leave me. Save yourself. I'm going to die. And he says, no, I can't leave you. I've got to take you. And he gets grazed by a bullet and he's pulling his friend back to the bunker and you're watching this. And you're going, this is amazing, right? This guy's a hero, isn't he? He's risking his own life for his buddy. You get back to the bunker and all of a sudden your, your angle zooms out. And as you look at these two men, he's bandaging his, his buddy. You realize there's a flag waving over that bunker. That's a, that's a black flag. That's the flag of ISIS. And they're wearing black. And these guys are ISIS warriors. And they were going to try to rape, pillage, destroy that city. And they were going to massacre thousands of people. Does your opinion of the man change? Yeah. Now you say, it doesn't matter what he does, he's evil. Right? Behold, humanity. God looks down upon mankind and sees us. And we go, but I built a hospital. But I helped her across the street. I gave money at church today. But he sees the uniform you're wearing. And it's a uniform of self-love, idolatry, self-worship. It doesn't matter what you do, so long as you are doing it under the name of allegiance to self. You guys following me? Sin. Isaiah says our sins have created a separation between you and God. There's not a relationship there. <clears throat> and guess what? I've got more bad news for you. You ready for the bad news? These are some of the three most terrifying words you will ever hear. God is good. God is good. That ought to terrify us. What does a good judge do to a guilty criminal? They put him away. Do you realize God is good? And we're not. You want to know how good God is? Revelation 21. Speaking of heaven, it says no unclean thing will ever enter heaven. Ever. Because God is there. God is so good, so holy, that he can't be in the presence of evil in his heaven, in his glorified presence. He can't, he, he can't abide evil. Have you ever noticed 
When you read through your Bible, have you ever noticed when people catch a vision of God? Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne. Above him stood the seraphim, the angels. They stood above him, each with six wings. With two they flew. With two they covered their eyes. With two they covered their feet. And the one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Angels. Holy, holy, holy is God. What's Isaiah's reaction to that vision in Isaiah 6? Doesn't he go, whoa, look at this. This is amazing. You know what he does? He says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. When Isaiah saw the goodness of God, the holiness of God, immediately it terrified him and made him realize how filthy he is. Same thing happens with Simon Peter in Luke chapter 5. Simon Peter's out fishing. Jesus comes to the shore, says, cast your net to the other side. He casts and they get the fish, right? Simon Peter realizes, whoa, this is him. This is the Messiah. So Simon doesn't come up and say, hey, can I be in your clan? Can I be like your top, top dog? You know what he says? Depart from me. I'm a wicked man. Get away from me, Jesus. I'm a wicked man. The, John, the apostle, he writes the book of Revelation. It's the revelation he received. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus appears to John. And you know what the Bible says? He fell like dead. He just falls over when he sees Jesus. So holy and glorious. My point is this. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a glorious God. Which means he punishes the wicked. He cannot abide sin. He cannot stand sin. And guess what? The requirement to enter heaven is perfection. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Guys, God is good. That's terrifying news for us because we're not. We're evil. You know Ecclesiastes 12, 14? You want to know what it says? In the day of judgment, every single action done, whether secret or or in public, is going to be judged and revealed. Every single action. If I took some of your thoughts and put them on the screen, where would you go? You'd run, right? If I took some of your thoughts from the last seven days and said, hey, we're going to watch Tom's thoughts. Let's watch Tom's thoughts. Hey, Tom. Tom, where are you going, Tom? We're just going to watch your thought life. The thoughts you've thought, right? The words you've said, the places you've gone, the things you've done. All of it's going to be judged. Guys, we've got to get this. The depth of sin and the glory of God. And Isaiah says, separated. We are separated. But there is good news. There is good news. God has actually made a way for wicked, vile sinners like you and me to come to peace with him. He's actually made a way for us to be reunited and brought into a peaceful relationship with him. What is that way? That way is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh, God in human body. And Jesus left the eternal dwelling place of heaven to come to this sin-plagued, wicked world. Why did Jesus come? He came to bear the curse of sin by substituting himself in the place of of sinners. When John the Baptist saw him, he proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came to substitute himself for sinners like you and me. Isn't that amazing? How did he do that? Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. Never lied, never cheated, never stole. He gave to God the Father perfect honor, perfect worship, never sought glory for himself as he submitted himself in his humanity. Jesus Christ was the perfect law keeper. He never lusted. He was never angry. You guys do realize the first two commandments, right? 
Some of us define goodness this way. I say, are you good enough for, for God? And people say, yeah, I've never lied. I've never, uh, well, that would be your first lie. But they, they say, I've never, I've never murdered. We forget something about the law. Two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you are not absolutely, perfectly, constantly loving God with every fiber of your being and always constantly, perfectly loving your neighbor as yourself, you're breaking the law. Jesus fulfilled it. Perfect love. Perfect righteousness. And he came and lived the life we couldn't live. But that's not all, guys. He then died the death that we deserve to die. Amazing. Jesus Christ came to earth and substituted himself. He stepped in our place. He literally was put in the place. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. It's saying he's perfect. He never sinned. But God made him to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ came to take the place of sinners. To take the place of the vile, evil, wicked sinner like you and me. He died on the cross to bear the sins of the world. But guess what, guys? Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, after being crucified, he rose. He actually rose from the dead conquering the cha chains of sin and death, defeating the greatest enemy of death itself, thus finishing the work of redemption. He defeated death. That's a pretty big enemy, isn't it? Everybody, I don't know, some of you guys might be slackers and be late to stuff. Who's late often? <laughs> You, you might be late to this appointment or that appointment, but guess what? There's one appointment you will never be late to, and that is the time appointed for you to die, death. And Jesus Christ came and defeated the greatest enemy, death itself. He rose from the grave. The book of Acts tells us he, was, he rose from the grave for it was not possible for him to be held by death. Isn't that awesome? He's in the grave. Death has overcome him. And it wasn't possible. Death wasn't strong enough to keep Christ dead. He rose from the grave. He thus broke the power of death, which is the power of sin, the power of the law. He broke it. He conquered it. The greatest enemy. And guys, I've heard of some pretty cool superheroes who defeat some pretty big enemies but what hero has ever defeated the greatest enemy of all enemies? Death itself. Jesus Christ alone. The question that you should be asking yourself now, for some of you, if you haven't already, is this. How can I be saved from my sin? I want you guys to think of yourself here. It's easy when you're in a group of guys um, to kind of think about others, right? Think about your buddies that are here and you think about Airsoft and, and all that stuff. But I want, you to, I want you to imagine you're the only person in this room and God is going to deal with you in Judgment Day, right? You're not going to have your homies there. You're not going to have your boys there to say, well, we all kind of did it. No, he's going to say, you, you, give an account. And the question you should ask is, how can I have what Jesus did on the cross be applied to me so that my sins are totally washed away. Even the worst things I've done, the worst things I've thought, washed away where Christ took it for me. How can I? Very simple. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent means this. Literally, it's a change of mind. Some of you need to repent tonight. Some of you have never believed the things I've said. Oh, you may believe it in the sense of you ascribe to it. You say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, 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 I go to church. Oh, yeah, if you're going to have a debate in school, you'd say, oh, you're crazy for not believing in God. Of course, there's a God and you have all the arguments, okay? You believe it. 
but some of you have never changed your mind truly about it. And this is what I mean. You say, change your mind about what? what? What does it mean to change your mind? Change your mind about the fact of sin. God says you deserve eternal damnation for even one sin you've committed because of how holy he is. Believe him. Believe him. Don't say, ah, I'll be all right. Believe him. Some of you haven't believed that Jesus Christ alone can rescue you from your sin. You're actually, you might say Jesus has, but in your heart, you're actually trusting yourself. So if I were to ask you, why would you go to heaven when you die? And you say, well, because I, you're trusting yourself. I go to church. I'm a leader in the church group. I, self. Change your mind. Repent. Believe that Jesus Christ alone can save you from your sin. Repent of your sin. Have a change of mind about who is Lord and Master in your life. Remember idolatry, the root of it. If you're still in your idolatry, which means you're still living for yourself, you've got to repent of that. God, forgive me. It's not just, oh, God, forgive me for being mean to Sally, you know, at school. It's God, forgive me for worshiping, loving, serving myself rather than you. God, forgive me. I don't want to serve myself anymore. I want to serve you. That's repentance, guys. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means entrust your soul to Christ to save you. Belief is not intellectual only. Belief means you cast yourself upon Christ and say, Christ, if you don't save me, I'm lost. Repent and believe the gospel. Guys, I urge you tonight, for those of you who have yet to do that, come to Christ tonight. You've got a Savior with his arms out saying, I'll save you from your sin. I'll rescue you from the wrath of God, which is coming. Come to me. I've done it on the cross 2,000 years ago. I lived the life you couldn't live. Stop trying to live up to the law. I lived it. And I took the penalty that you deserve. Come to me. At this moment, God has two hands up to you. You realize that? Two hands up to you. With one, he's urging you to come. Come to me. With the other, he is holding back his wrath and his justice. And there is coming a moment when you do not know when it will be, when both hands will drop. He will no longer ask you to come. And he will no longer hold back his justice and wrath. My friend, while you've still got breath in your lungs, while you've still got blood coursing through your veins, come to Christ. Repent of your sin and believe on him as Lord and Savior. And then, and only then, can you go about the business of being like Christ and being a man like Christ and following in his footsteps, you first got to come to know Christ with an experiential saving knowledge. Let's pray. Father, I pray that these boys, these men who have never come to repent of their sin, their self-love, their self-worship, oh God, I pray that they would come now. That they would repent of their sins. That they would cry out to You, oh God, forgive me for my idolatry. And that they would put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who is crushed for their iniquities, chastised for their sin. Father, I pray that this night would be the night of salvation for those here who do not yet know you. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.